So it says in your program, I'm the dinner speaker. I get it. We've had dinner. We've had dessert. So uh, I'm really the last, uh, last thing in line to get you out, out the door. So I don't want to uh, spend a lot of time talking tonight, but I want to give you a flavor of uh, some of my thoughts about Congress and, and China. But before I do that, I want to certainly thank the U.S. China Policy Foundation for the uh, invitation to speak here tonight and for uh, Dr. and Madam Wong for um, having me here tonight. I, I very much appreciate that. And, uh, Ambassador Solomon, Ambassador Sasser as well, thank you. But uh, let's give another hand to the honorees tonight, Secretary Elaine Chow and, and Admiral uh, William Fallon. For, uh, <laughs> so as uh, Jim mentioned, I'm the co-founder and co-chair of the U.S.-China Working Group. It's a, a group of um, members of Congress who came together about 10 and a half years ago with my colleague Mark Kirk from Illinois, who has now um, uh, uh, demeaned himself by becoming a senator, and started, a, started another group. He started a U.S. China Working Group in the Senate with Maisie Hirono from Hawaii, and uh, now the chair, the Republican chair, is Charles Bustani from Louisiana. And we created this group to kind of create a space in the U.S. House of Representatives at the time where we could discuss the various relationships and issues that the U.S. has with China. And that's been a theme throughout the last 10 years, that we don't have a relationship with China. We have many relationships with China, depending on the issue. So we really try to parse um, issues and try not to focus on only security, or only the economy, or only human rights, or, or only one set of things, but try to get the, uh, a broader perspective. And I'd, I'd like to think that we've, we've been successful in, in helping to elevate the conversation in, the, in Congress about, about China, because I think engagement with China is really the only way to strengthen these various relationships. And, I'd have to say right now, the relationship, in my view, is one of hopes and, and one of hurdles, and I want to cover a few of those. First, um, on the issue of hope, uh, I think that um, a very practical element of, of, a hope, of the hopeful part of the relationship is uh, the uh, potential of a bilateral investment treaty between the U.S. and China. There's continued progress on it. Uh, my co-chairs in the Senate and the House, uh, we sent a letter to Secretary Pritzker. Um, this week asking uh, her to press Chinese leaders during the 26th annual U.S.-China uh, Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade for a higher standard uh, bit or uh, bilateral investment treaty. I think this can be accomplished. But I also think that you will start to see uh, state and local officials push for investment. And the bit can help set those rules and create jobs here in the, in, uh, in, uh, so it's about to say Washington State. I always think I'm in Washington State. Um, but hopefully in Washington State, and maybe other states too. Uh, but certainly in the state where I come from. But the, the point is, you're going to see a lot of state and local official, officials pushing for this kind of investment. I think another level of hope is uh, leader exchanges. Now, this September, uh, President Xi visited um, my state, uh, visited Washington, D.C., and New York as well. And he spent the longest amount of time in Washington State. In fact, at one event, I was asked by uh, a person in the audience, what do I make of the fact that President Xi is spending more time in Washington State than in Washington, D.C.? And my answer was, wouldn't you? <laughs> um, so I'd have to say President Xi, as far as where he picks to travel, is a very smart man. Uh, he certainly knows how to travel. But I also think, uh, more importantly, he, he not only went to Seattle, he went to Everett, he went to Tacoma, went out to Redmond. The point is he got out of the main city and went out to other places. And that's a lesson that we have in the U.S.-China Working Group when we travel to China. It's like the Beijing, Shanghai, we get down to Hong Kong. But we also try to get out to other large cities and smaller areas outside the large cities uh, in the west uh, of China as well. Because it's important to get out of the main cities, get a better feel for, uh, for the country that you're in. As well on these exchanges, President Obama has uh, visited China as part of his nine visits to Asia. It's currently in the Philippines for uh, APEC. And I think the President's trip is critical to advancing the rebalance that the, that the administration has talked about, which demands that we continue to build our relationships uh, with China as well. And the President's presence in Manila will uh, most likely have a positive impact on the bit as he's speaking with uh, Chinese interlocutors and other discussions uh, where the issue, uh, where that issue will come up, places like the JCCT, because the U.S. is engaged in Asia. Climate change is another, another area of hope, and I think the steps that China and the U.S. have taken together to address climate change are very positive. I think that the two countries are setting an example for the rest of the world, which is important because the two countries are the two largest energy consumers. 
So I'm hopeful that our joint actions will create a positive momentum leading into the Climate Change Conference uh, hosted by our uh, great friends from uh, Paris, France um, later this month and, and into, into next month. So um, a few hurdles, though, because hurdles do exist in the relationship. And uh, currency continues to be one of them. Uh, China's devaluation of its currency in July gave my uh, currency hawk friends every reason in the world to say, I told you so. Um, this devaluation really hurt the relationship economically between the two countries. It creates volatility in the economic markets, setting our relation, relationship back, and, and, and again, gives members of Congress who see currency as a major issue uh, fodder for, um, for, uh, for criticism against China. The South China Sea is another area where there's uh, hurdles. I sit on the uh, Armed Services Committee, and I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize my defense hawk friends um, by bringing up the South China Sea as a hurdle. I, I myself see it as a hurdle. China's continued efforts in the South China Sea in what seems to be a play to redefine sovereignty against international norms gives me concerns. But this dispute has unfortunately increased tensions between our countries. But I do want to you know, reiterate what the President said. The U.S. position is to end the building of these islands. And under no international law does building islands give any country sovereignty over an area. But I think as well, because this conversation is taking place, diplomacy and dialogue is the right approach to take as we try to find uh, you know, solutions to that hurdle. Cyber is another hurdle. And it's a, it's a hurdle because anyone who's read the newspaper lately knows that no discussion of hurdles is complete without mentioning cybersecurity. Cyber hacking potentially impacts every American. And members of Congress hear that from every American, the people we represent. So the OPM hack recently shined a harsh light on OPM for not acting to secure its own records but an equally harsh light on the potential source of that attack. And so I think you're, you know, cyber hacking is going to, con going to continue to be an area of concern and a potential hurdle to the relationship, although the U.S. and China did reach an agreement when President Xi and President Obama met about cyber issues, but it is not a cure-all, uh, but still it's better to have that agreement and implement that agreement moving forward together, uh, redefining or defining, that is, for the two countries uh, what it means to help each other out to uh, diminish the opportunities for cyber hacks. So there, are, there is opportunity in those hurdles. Finally, um, as I go through this list of hope and hurdles, I'm reminded again that our relationship with China uh, is not that different than other relationships. The truth is that every relationship takes a lot of work. It's important to focus on the things that can help move that relationship along. Now, small efforts help strengthen the relationships as much as these bigger efforts that you hear about all the time. A few months ago, my wife Tia uh, took visiting Chinese students on a capital tour, a tour that um, many people don't have an opportunity to do uh, here. And it was really behind the scenes. It was on a Sunday. The place was closed down. So basically had free run of the place. And as my wife aptly noted to me, this tour is a small gesture. And small gestures like this one um, end up being another positive step in U.S.-China relations when you get an opportunity to give a tour to uh, local high school students along with the uh, Chinese high school students. In Washington State, the University of Washington and Tsinghua University created a partnership to launch a global innovation exchange to collaborate on technology. And recently, I met with some folks, and my wife Tia met with folks from 100,000 strong student exchange organization that started under um, Secretary Clinton, um, and some, are, some of those folks are here tonight. And we've discussed the cultural and economic and policy imp importance of the one million strong initiative, which will increase fivefold the number of U.S. K through 12 students studying, ma studying Mandarin in the United States. These smaller efforts um, will increase the engagement and translate into moving this these various relationships that we have with China um, forward, and hopefully giant steps forward. So I'm looking forward to see the impacts of these steps as we have time now to maybe clear those hurdles out in front of us, leaving us with room to build hope. Uh, so with that, I want to thank the Foundation again very much for an opportunity to say a few words, give you a little perspective on one, one member of Congress's view on the U.S.-China relationship. And to Dr. Wong and Madam Wong, thank you very much for this opportunity.